We have a rather controversial subject, but at the same time, I think it is necessary to explore it with some thoroughness. The new lines of quick-selling nonfiction seem to be dominated at the present moment by uh, weight reduction programs and psychic phenomena. They, together, they have a certain problem in common. Both can be very unhappy if abused. And the tendency today is to go along doing what we feel like doing, influenced by anyone we accept influence from, rejecting influence from anyone whom we disapprove of, and as a result, some very serious complications often set in. From the beginning of history, psychic phenomena has existed. There is no people so primitive that they have not had various types of mystery and magic associated with their religions. There has never been a civilized or sophisticated culture that has not also sustained a metaphysical philosophy in a minority group pattern. These beliefs have never completely dominated advanced societies, but they have influenced practically every level of human uh, social thinking, philosophy, health, religion, scholarship, and economics. It seems rather unusual that our present century, which has been so heavily indoctrinated with materialism, should find itself confronted with such an extraordinary expansion of metaphysical thinking. We have always had some of it in this country. We've had some very nice people in it. We've had very sincere, very dignified, very conscientious exponents. And for spiritualism in principle, we must admit one important contribution it has made. For thousands, perhaps millions of human beings, it has brought a sense of the reality of the survival of consciousness after death. In other words, it has been a defense against the broadly based scientific materialism of our modern society. That this has been useful, that it has consoled, that it has brought understanding and insight, has inspired the living to a better way of life, all these facts are history. We know they are true. But we observe other forces and factors slowly creeping in uh, to the problem as we face it today. I don't think we should condemn any form of metaphysical phenomena, but I think we should learn to discipline our own minds to the degree that we can select that which is useful to us and not become completely involved in situations which we do not understand and for which we are never likely to get a satisfactory explanation. It is a case of the individual carefully thinking through the problems of his own acceptances. If he is going to believe something, he must know why. He must be able to defend his belief against ordinary, conventional, reasonable skepticism. He must also be willing to make the adjustments in his personal life which might be involved in the improvement of his internal attitudes and his superphysical constitution. Therefore, we begin by pointing out that when you are confronted with a revelation of some kind, and they are almost continuous at the present moment, you must ask yourself the very simple question, what is the authority, what is the fact, what is the substance behind uh, the affirmation or the belief? 
We have a right to know the source of information we are expected to believe. And here is where we very often find a difficulty at the present moment, where revelations are attributed to beings not in this world, to uh, persons we have never heard of, or to uh, past traditions that have been secret for ages and never been thoroughly understood. When these factors are prominent in a revelation, we must pause and consider. We must try to find out where these various beliefs come from that are now getting into print in almost fabulous numbers. At the very beginning of our problem, we usually come against a very definite circumstance that is difficult to evaluate. If a belief arises from a psychic experience, how are we going to prove other than through the person who claimed to have that experience? How are we going to prove that this experience is genuine no matter who has it? The only proof that the average person is able to provide under such conditions is the reasonableness of the idea itself. If it is something that is commonly accepted as beneficial, we may entertain it with some confidence. But if it is something contrary to our basic judgments, if it goes contrary to our own integrities, then the fact that it comes from an unknown source does not justify its acceptance. We have to follow the admonition of the scriptures, weigh all things and cling to that which is good. So in revelations of all kinds, the problem remains, what is good? How are we going to know uh, the values involved in these types of revelations? Well, the first and perhaps the simplest approach to the matter is to consider for a moment the advantages or disadvantages of accepting an unprovable hypothesis. First of all, is it useful? A great many revelations of one kind or another are inspiring, but not solutional to the problems of personal living. The acceptance of them may be a gratification to us, but it does not necessarily help us to solve the daily problems of life. A revelation that does not concern the improvement of society directly may be regarded as of secondary importance, and if it cannot be justified, there is no urgent reason why we should desperately try to find out its source. If, however, the ideas have a very valid importance if they deal with very definite problems of the day, then we, I think, should take the new explanations or the revelations and interpret them in terms of already existing knowledge. I have read a number of these works in the course of years, and the majority of them are merely restatements in one form or another of basic principles that we have all known about and have been common property of mankind for ages. The mere fact that they are stated a little differently does not ma modify or dramatize their reality. If they are new and if they appear to have definite practical value, then we must really put ourselves to work to try and find out all that we can about the circumstances of such a revelation. We are usually, however, frustra frustrated almost immediately because they have come as a vision or a foreknowledge or a dream or through a mystical experience of another person, and we have no way of proving the truth or reality of these revelations. And the person through whom they came, apparently, usually has no proof. 
is not certain in their own minds and has been forced to accept that which they cannot prove or demonstrate. I have had hundreds of people come to me with various visions. I have asked many of them the source of the visions. And as far as they were concerned, they did not know the source of the very experiences through which they had passed. If these visions included some powerful personality out of the past, some great teacher, some great mystic, and the revelation is attributed to that person, then the revelation should be, it seems to me, checked and verified in the actual surviving knowledge relating to that person which already exists. I remember one case in particular of a uh, psychic experience involving a Greek philosopher. Actually, the experience was exactly contrary uh, to the known work of the scholar. Most of his writings were in existence and have been translated with some accuracy. But there was no obvious relationship between the psychic revelation and the known character and concepts of the original person. This is one way in which you can check some things. It is like another experience that came to me in which a person, a, a psychic, told me that they were receiving constant messages from King Arthur in English and in modern English, a language which was unknown to Arthur. Now they may say that uh, this was a matter of the original spirit translating or modernizing or mentally communicating in a way that would seem like modern spellings and modern pronunciations. But then came the revelation. What did King Arthur have to say? What was he contributing? Well, the high spot in the Revelation was a line attributed to him. Things are wonderful over here. <laughs> that was all we got out of it. Now, this amazed a great many people. <laughs> Maybe they didn't believe things were wonderful over there. But it was taken at a greater importance than it justified. There was no real basis upon which to build things. Now, most people who are interested in psychic phenomena are subject to a series of difficulties which have been recognized for thousands of years. And these difficulties are the effect of these mediumistic revelations upon family, upon friends, relations, the community, society in general, and the personal life of the individual who receives these communications. In France a number of years ago, the planchette, which we call the Ouija board, was in very wide usage, and after it had resulted in a vast number of disasters, crimes, murders, and things of this nature, the French government simply uh, made it a felony to own one because of the complete pandemonium it caused in the lives of people. An individual got a message on the Ouija board that their marriage partner was unfaithful. This led to a terrific situation, and it often proved conclusively that the information was wrong so that it caused all kinds of disruption. And it was far better, therefore, uh, not to permit this type of thing. It is back here and can be bought almost anywhere, and people are still using it and depending heavily upon it, in some cases, for the solution to problems. This is another problem that we have to face, namely leaning on psychic phenomena for the solution of daily problems. For most, uh, in most cases at least, the uh, psychic means is a substitute for thinking it through yourself. If there is a problem in life that needs to be solved, it should be attacked and approached with extreme common sense, reality, with integrity, simplicity, and forthrightness. 
There is no real reason why these matters should be left to an unknown uh, being, spirit, energy, force, or whatever it is, that might be involved in a psychic demonstration on the subject. We are here to face our own problems. We have no proof of any kind that deceased relatives are any wiser after they die than they were here. We are not in a condition to say that our uncle, has, having been deceased, can tell us what kind of stocks or bonds we should invest in now. But if through some psychic communication this information is relayed, we are very apt to wake up with our personal income completely destroyed by following psychic recommendations. It is therefore very definitely important that psychic phenomena uh, should serve its essential purpose. And that essential purpose is where it exists, is very intimate, very personal, non-commercial, and dealing with the simple problems of human life. The moment it becomes too fantastic, too exaggerated, too complicated, disaster is not far away. Actually, therefore, suppose we do need some help on a problem that faces us, and we do not know just where to go. We may try the local minister, and he couldn't handle it. We go to a counselor, they can't handle it. We go to a psychic because we think they are the only ones who can solve this problem. But when the message comes through, if it does, and they don't always come through, we have to then evaluate the solution that is recommended. To simply do it on the psychic pressure alone is unwise. But if we can take it and examine it, explore it, and discover that it is a practical answer and approaches the matter from a direction that we have not previously considered, it may be that we can be cautiously influenced to experiment moderately with the, with the course of events suggested psychically. It is, however, always a great mistake to go overboard, to suddenly decide that the invisible world is capable of running our personal affairs. If we do this long enough and consistently enough, we're going to get into very serious difficulties. Another point that I have noted increasingly in the last ten years has been messages, dreams, visions, and psychic experiences which have advocated certain disciplines for personal development. Uh, these have suggested what the person should do, how they should live, and how they should think in order to benefit from the great promise that has been made in the psychic revelation. I've gone through a number of these cases with people, and the difficulties have simply multiplied beyond all rational solution. Persons trying desperately uh, to meet the requirements of invisible voices or dreams or abstract symbols of which no certain explanation is available. These people get into trouble very, very seriously. They can be in trouble for the rest of their lives. One of the most common forms of this particular delusion is the belief that the individual is receiving a ministry. They have been called. They have been selected from all the world to bear witness to something of vast importance. The uh, full development of this importance will not be immediate, but if they do what they're told over a long period of time, it, ult it will ultimately be their privilege to become very important in some great service for mankind. This type of uh, revelation is a very discouraging one, because time after time these people go through the whole span of their lives, waiting expectantly, being promised time and time again that it will come, and then they pass on without ever having fulfilled any of these expectations. This type of psychic experience and many other forms of it also brings into focus another very important consideration. How can we tell the difference between a psychic experience and a psychological one? 
when we hear a voice or whether we see things that are out of this world or whether we come in contact with strange symbols or intuitively believe something, it is very necessary to determine the source of this pressure. And working with a number of these cases, it has become apparent that in a great many instances the revelations are wish fulfillments. They are nothing more nor less than the individual's own inner pressure appearing to him as a different personality. He uh, has always wanted to do a certain thing. The vision tells him to do it. He therefore does not hesitate. The fact that the desire in the first place may have been unreasonable is no longer considered. Most of the ordinary problems of metaphysical difficulty are traceable to some kind of personality pressure. The individual who has been frustrated in the effort to attain a dominant place in life may try to compensate by having a dominant religious revelation. A person who has had a poor chance uh, to uh, contact the public may find through a metaphysical outlet a group of sincere students who will venerate the contributions. In every direction, the psychic pressure frequently releases itself in the form of a metaphysical experience. Therefore, it is very important for every person in the world to live a kind of life that does not build up a neurotic pressure. Now, there are people who feel there's perhaps no way of escaping a neurotic pressure. But in many instances, this neurosis is the result of humoring a deficiency in the personality. The individual who is shy humors the shyness instead of getting over it. Uh, the individual who is critical justifies the criticism instead of recovering from it. And all the way along, a person who has a definitely dominant attitude, which is not healthy to start with, will frequently go along nursing this delinquency and intensifying it to the point that it breaks out in some form of a psychic disturbance. This is very common and is probably the answer to a great many cases where by some strange and wonderful circumstance the revelation is exactly what the individual wanted to hear. He heard it because he created it, but he does not know this. He is not dishonest. He is simply uh, unable to cope with the normal problems of his own personal life. He has been unable to live the kind of life that would justify a natural expansion of consciousness. He has not become uh, a servant of immediate values, of problems as they arise. He has not solved animosities. He has not overcome antagonisms. He is no longer able to get along with people who do not think the way he does. And little by little he isolates himself, never for a moment doubting the certainty of his own attitude. Regardless of what has happened, he is correct. This type of pressure leads to neurotic symptoms which are very frequent in religion and may end in definite religious fanaticism. The person simply is unable to recognize the pressure of a certain inward attitude breaking through. It is perfectly possible for our attitudes or our emotions to become in the mind not only dramatized but visualized. Under hypnotic suggestion we know definitely that it is possible to wipe out a person standing in a room. If there are six persons standing in a room and the person who is under hypnosis comes in, the, upper, the hypnotic operator can cause that person to eliminate one of the people in the room. All the others will be there, just as they are, but one person will simply not be there. Sometimes it has happened, rather curiously, that the person eliminated was sitting in a chair. 
the person under hypnosis later went over and sat on the chair with the person and did not know it was there. Under the pressure of hypnotic suggestion, individuals who do not exist in a group can be made to be seen there, or persons who do exist can be eliminated from the picture, or persons of different appearances can be conjured into the picture all arising in the mind itself. Now it has been of course pointed out or suggested that the hypnotic, the hypnotist is responsible for all the phenomena. He is only responsible for directing an attitude. And uh, in a short time, few days at the most, any direction he gives will disappear entirely. But at the moment, he can make that which is not there appear to be there. He can make that which is there to appear not to be there. He can change the shapes of things that are visible. He can change the outline of a city. He can change the attitude of the person on almost any subject in life. But the actual change is taking place in the mind of the subject. It is possible under certain pressures for the mind of the subject to precipitate itself in the form of a vocal statement. It can talk with the rest of the mind. It can create tremendous emotional intensities. It can result in visual phenomena. And the majority of cases, these inward pressures of the person themselves are responsible for things apparently seen outwardly or in dreams or in semi-waking conditions or in trances, or something of this nature. Therefore, wherever any extrasensory phenomenon presents itself, the conscious functions of the personality must protect the individual from either outside imposture or self-imposture. And of course, in the larger number of cases, self-imposture is the problem that must be faced. It is quite possible for the individual to live an entire lifetime trying to fulfill a secret pressure within himself, trying to accomplish something that really is not to be accomplished, is not suitable, is not natural, is not next in the life and development of that individual. On the other hand, we have another problem that must not be ignored. We have what Emerson called the overself. There is a part of man's inner life that is greater than the personality that we see. According to certain esoteric systems, the overself is a being that is built up from many previous incarnations. It is an ancient because it has the wisdom of maybe 500 previous lives. But it is not a person. It is a record. It is a subjective, uh, uh, extramental phenomena, intuitional if you wish to call it. It can be a very vital factor in development of a personality. Suppose we say that a person is very simple, very honest, very kindly, and very well-intentioned, and is in a situation in which a special knowledge is needed. The person is not quite apt, able to control the situation. They will pray and pray devoutly for divine guidance. And in the prayer for divine guidance, it is very often that the over self steps in and wisdom not available in the present embodiment may be brought into embodiment through the inner life of the person, the psychic internal self. Under such conditions there are types of actual revelation in which something superior is achieved, something that is necessary is made available, and frequently we read and hear of cases in which prayers have been mysteriously and apparently miraculously answered. It's very likely in most of those cases that the prayers have released information 
understanding, insight, consciousness, realization, or even dedication that has been built up gradually in the over-self. Under such conditions, a certain revelation may be true, and this is frequently referred to as a mystical experience. A mystical experience is largely, in most instances, the individual brought into the presence of the sum of his own achievement in the past, bearing with it a solution, a realization. Perhaps in this incarnation, for instance, a person has been much concerned with materialism and has not developed uh, the, the mystical side of their nature. In a great emergency, the mysticism comes back. There is a, de a deep and sincere prayer for guidance in an emergency. And very often this guidance is available through a mystical experience. And this experience arising from the total of the human being's available knowledge over the period of his entire human existence. This can be a very, very vital and important principle. There are other, also other factors that do, uh, deal directly with our own uh, achievements and our own uh, accomplishments. Mystical experiences are very strange things, but they are always triggered by something. They are triggered either by an incident, a reminiscence, an emergency, or the coming together of patterns of events which repeat previous patterns. All of these things can occur to the individual. Uh, mostly, the mystical experience is, as the name suggests, related to the mystics, to mysticism itself. The opening of the door into the inner life is very largely a mystical project. And mysticism has as its final foundation personal integrity. The individual who is really interested in cultivating an inner life and fulfilling as far as possible uh, the dreams and hopes and aspirations that have perhaps been intellectually accepted. This person must then do what is suggested in the scripture. Only those who live the life can know the doctrine. Therefore, the true mystic becomes an embodiment of the natural virtues of humanity. He is moderate in all things. He has no longer domination from the self within him, so his own nature. He is not egotistic. He is not ambitious. He is not in any way attempting to achieve a temporal advancement by spiritual means. He is not asking the gods to make him rich. He is perhaps asking them to take away from him what he has because always what we have can interfere with what we are, and it can certainly interfere with what we should be. Therefore, the mystic becomes a very humble, simple servant of human need. He works every day to be helpful. He tries to be a good gardener in the garden of the Lord. He is helpful wherever possible. He holds no prejudices. He caters to no deceits. He shares no gossip, he is not spiteful, and he does everything possible to live a simple, honorable life. This is the prerequisite. But the majority of persons who get involved in unfortunate psychic experiences have somewhere in themselves a measure of subjective self-centeredness. They have a, a, a tendency to want something for themselves. They want to be wealthy. They want to be healthy. They want to have a, a good marriage or get rid of a bad one. They want something. And they are using religion in one way or another to accomplish the desire that they have. They are not seeking it primarily in order to serve God. They are seeking it in order to fulfill their own wishes and attitudes. This, of course, immediately locks the genuine experience. The individual cannot possibly live on a plane of self-centeredness and achieve that which is based upon the overcoming of self-centeredness. 
Each individual in this world, for some reason or other, thinks of himself always as an individual. He thinks of himself as one among many, and he sees himself with his destiny slowly unfolding under the pressures of external circumstance against which he struggles with might and main. He is determined to try always to be himself. This definite effort not to sink and to keep the ego alive, to keep the personality dominant in our conduct, in itself will lock the gate to adjusted and to justify spiritual growth. So we have someone that comes and they have for a number of years been studying with a, a certain person. They come to me simply because they're in trouble. They have followed the exercises and advice of the teacher that they have, and they are in difficulties. They can't sleep, they can't eat, they're nervous wrecks. Uh, even their uh, favorite family psychologist has given them up. They come in a very messy condition. They're seeing things, feeling things, believing things that simply are not of this world or any other legitimate sphere. So they come and they say they're in terrible trouble. And they tell me, or maybe they don't give the name, but they imply where the trouble started. My answer to this is almost always the same. Go to the teacher whom you are following and tell them to take care of it. They got you into it. Let them get you out of it. A week later, the person is back. They had gone to the teacher who told them he couldn't do anything about it, and also that it wasn't his fault anyway, it was theirs. Now, this is hollow comfort when you're in trouble. The truth of the matter is the person teaching was not qualified to teach, and the individual who received the teaching was not qualified to receive even a legitimate teaching. The combination was trouble, and always will be. And there are a great many systems of culture at the present time that are based entirely upon some kind of a vision or some kind of a symbolism which has impelled the individual to believe that he has the key to the infinite. All the time this is going on, people are in trouble and in desperate need of intelligent spiritual directives. It seems to me that in this materialistic culture that is dominating us at the present time, that about the only security that the average person can find is within himself. He must have certain periods of time in which he can strengthen his re resolutions concerning life. Now, there are many ways in which people try to do this. One, of course, is through the biblical route, reading the scriptures and uh, meditating upon such problems as the Lord's Prayer and the Sermon on the Mount. These people are seeking to restore spiritual confidence by placing their faith foremost in their lives. Most of these people, if they are really sincere, gain a great deal of good from this. And uh, if they are able to withstand the pressure of circumstances and be true to the faith they believe, they will in due time come out all right. There are others, however, that try desperately to outgrow themselves. They are not satisfied to grow. They've got to rush the growth. They've got to get themselves constantly into dangerous situations by overdoing something. Socrates says, in all things, not too much. And this is true of religion as it is true of any other activity. The idea that some people hold that you can't have too much theology is not true. It is true that you need the constant presence of a spiritual truth within yourself. But it is something that you should take with you into every area of your life. You do not sit somewhere quietly and visualize this truth. You go out into the world and visualize it in the daily conduct of your affairs. You see the truth you believe reflected to you from practically everything you see, from the sky 
uh, to the morning newspaper, and to see integrity reflected from that is quite a trick. But it can be done if you understand correctly. So the problem is as to meditate a little and apply what you feel inside to a large area of outward experiences. As long as it remains completely theoretical, as long as it is all locked up within a small pattern, the person will not have very much result. Now we suggest very definitely problems of meditation. We do not teach any disciplines whatsoever as such, but we do suggest very often that each individual should set aside maybe 15 minutes a day for a quiet talk with something inside himself. It's not something that he is going to meet with a great ritualistic approach. It is simply the quietude of revising and reviving the inner life, where the person quietly thinks through the principles he believes and strengthens the resolution to apply these principles to the normal functions of his life. A little, a little of this is very valuable. We should all, regardless of our orthodoxy or our heterodoxy, have some time of prayer, of meditation, of good thought, of kindly and generous hope and feeling for the rest of humanity. Never under any condition should such a feeling be limited simply on our own hope to be spiritual. It should be a desire to be whatever the law of life wanted us to be, to release through ourselves those values that are there because deity placed them there, not simply because we want to do something extraordinary or remarkable. All that we can any of us be in all reality is a pen in the hand of a ready writer. We are instruments of the divine purpose, and we should be able to remember this, think about it, meditate on it, and gain the quiet strength that comes from a holy purpose. But if this is carried on as in a monastic order, so that prayers and meditations are practically continuous, something is missed. Something very serious is wrong, and the, most of the churches have realized this. They have realized that it is necessary for those who are of a worshipful mind and soul to also find practical fields of, ser of service, ways of helping each other. Uh, in many of the monastic orders, the members of the orders may take care of land, produce food, go out and serve the needy in various respects. Nuns and sisters these days are working hospitals and schools. There must never be a religious dedication that is not accompanied by a symbolic offering upon the temple altar. And that offering is our own daily life, lived in harmony with the principles we came, uh, claim to believe. So it is always very important for us to balance any devotional program that we have with a good, clean-cut, factual attitude. Another point that must also be taken into consideration and is very prominent in cases of psychic phenomena is the tendency of the millions and millions and hundreds of millions of religious people to consider faith a kind of a depressing thing, something that is so desperately serious that we cannot approach it with anything except a very great sense of sadness dejection, that we are born in sin and conceived in iniquity. A very cheerful thought in a universe ruled over by a benevolent God. But many people feel that the very secret of spirituality is to be miserable, that it is a mistake for people who are spiritual to enjoy themselves in anything. They should be down on their knees constantly regretting their sins or begging heaven to enlighten them. This is ruinous and accomplishes not only no good for the individual, but no good for anyone else. So we must realize, I think the Greeks came nearer to it than most any other people, that religion is a joyous adventure. 
It is an adventure in happiness, an adventure in admiring that which is truly good. It is the realization that we are children of a benevolent plan, that we are not slaves, we are not outcasts, we are the children of divinity. And this divinity is creating for us everything necessary for our own happiness unless we spoil it ourselves. And all the so-called tragedies of life are in a large measure disciplines. And if we had not made certain mistakes, those disciplines would not be there. But the essential principle of religion is joyous. It is full of hope, faith, and love. And where these cease or fail or are overshadowed by the terrors of the time, there is a despondency which is extremely detrimental uh, to the growth of the person himself. And this despondency is also largely reflected in psychical phenomena. Most of the pr prophecies that are coming from no one knows where today are despondent. Nine out of ten books of prophecy announce direful things. Everything is going to go wrong. Some years ago, about ten years ago to be exact, I picked up a couple of books of this type of prophecy. And I looked them over, and it told what year uh, the great earthquake was likely, and another year in which plagues would rage the earth, and another year where wars and calamities would come in. It was really, really very cheerful literature, <laughs> but had a wide circulation because they intrigued the emotional pressures of the person. The incidents were dated. And coming upon the situation many years later, I chanced to look through the books. Every date that they had mentioned had already passed, and the various events just didn't happen. Well, when an event like that doesn't happen, there's only one thing, there are two things possible. One is that we made a mistake, and the other is that God changed his mind. And I think it is safer to assume that we made a mistake. And I think that mistake is partly due to this sadness, this sorrowness, this martyrdom that we have associated with religion for centuries. What we need is a religion that rejoices in good instead of being a faith which constantly punishes evil and often mistakes the most common healthy attitudes of people for evil. If a person is happy, they are some way morally delinquent. It is taken for granted. Well, actually, if we look at the sky and the mountains and the rivers, we see the universe as a pretty happy thing. It has its problems. It's not all one grand vacation. But there is an infinite opportunity uh, to express gratitude, to understand the rules and laws of life, and to learn to obey them. I've been much impressed recently with the nature films that have been appearing on television. These nature films tell us beyond anything in the world can deny that animals, birds, insects, all kinds of creatures have loyalties, have convictions, and that in all through the animal kingdom the mother defends her young and never under any condition does she fail in the development of those instincts which have been glorified, amplified, and intensified in the life of the human being. If we are in a world of law and order, and if that law and order is maintained, there are no great shadows on the walls. The, when we read the white handwriting on the wall of heaven, we should remember we did the writing, not the hand of the infinite. It is our own failure to live the principles we believe. And there is no possibility of a psychic experience being a substitute for right living, a substitute for the joy experienced in a realization of something. All around us there are marvelous things to know and to do. So with our religion we take a little time each day which we might consider devoted to digestion, to assimilation. Uh, to making the things of the day realities that are going to live on in our lives. The adventures of each day have their meanings. 
things we have done, things we have seen, things we have learned, are all very important parts of our unfolding consciousness. So, as a result of that, it is good for us to have a diversified life. One of the problems that we've had in recent years is the vital and, and terrible differentiation between sacred and secular matters. On the one hand is religion, on the other hand is the rest of the world. We are expected to live entirely on a level of revelations and of certain uh, in inhibitions and frustrations. On the other side is the secular world. Now the secular world isn't all it ought to be, but as far as that concerned, neither is the religious world. These worlds are both under pressures. But in the secular world, we have opportunities to develop values which we should not overlook. The mere fact that we want to become spiritual should not prevent us from studying arts and sciences, from developing skills, from increasing knowledge. It does not develop an adversity against hobbies or interests. It doesn't prevent us from becoming square dancers or anything of this nature. It depends upon ourselves. But the person who is all wrapped up in themselves is the smallest package in the world. It is something no one can afford to be. So our religion should be constantly fed by constructive experiences. It should be fed by beautiful art, beautiful music, by a journey into the woods or into the forest. It should be fed by the experience of being with children or watching and working with the aged. Everything that happens is important. And it's all important in helping us to mature. And our spiritual over-self is released in our maturity. Nothing else can release it. And wherever we block out anything that is constructive, that is reasonable, we limit on or restrict our own growth. And the growth that is most important is the growth that we gain by living constructive lives in this world. And this is the thing that is being damaged to some degree at least by the present tendencies in, uh, we might say, metaphysical religions. There is too much emphasis upon the religious side and its frustrations. But the main reason for this, in most cases, is the subtle problem of the individual catering to his own desire to be enlightened. All of these various, or most of these various patterns, offer the person the opportunity for greater spiritual growth, quick, by a system, by following a certain attitude, uh, by joining a certain organization, this person gains a superior relationship with other human beings. And this superiority is the defeating factor. The individual who tries to save his life shall lose it. But the one who loses his life in the service of God gains everlasting life. The person who is constantly trying to be saved is not the one who gets there. The one who gets there is the one who has forgotten all to save someone else and maybe drowns with them. It is a different attitude, a different relationship with life. And this different relationship of life is being very definitely undermined at the present time in many areas. It is Everything seems to be based upon making it easier for people to be weak. Making it easier to, for people to get what they want without deserving it and of course making it easier for those with certain skills to exploit those who do not have these skills. All that has to do with the growth of the person is a result of attitudes. In other words, enlightenment is the final reward for good karma. And uh, enlightenment is inevitable. The idea that karma goes on forever is false to the teachings of the East, both Buddhist and, and Hindu. Karma is something that is the accumulation of mistakes. And this accumulation of mistakes con constantly confronts us with situations by which we could understand these mistakes and correct them. But enlightenment is the result of good karma. 
It is a result of the individual who has given everything of himself, demanding nothing, and who has placed the good of all above the good of the individual, who has tried in every way possible to serve the plan which is to release all humanity from their own ignorance, superstition, and fear. The person in, who has forgotten himself in the service of others is the one most likely to receive a legitimate revelation. All others must be regarded with certain apprehension, certain misgivings, because they do not represent the proper approach to the problems of life. So here we are in our present century with all these things happening and all this flood of literature coming in on us and all these different ways. And we'll stop for a moment and go into the other area of consideration, and that is nutrition. Well, nut nutrition is to the body what integrities are to the mind and soul. The individual is now becoming more and more health conscious. But health to him is merely the fulfillment of his desire for physical freedom from ailments. He is very much like Alcibiades in the uh, Dialogues of Plato. Uh, Plato once said of, uh, of Alcibiades, who was more or less a, an Athenian uh, pop, a, a, a person of, who thought a great deal of himself and uh, did very little that was good in life. So one, someone once said, what about Alcibiades? And Socrates said, he is a young man with a lead dagger in a diamond sheath. He has a wonderful body and nothing in it. Now today, most people are, are functioning on that attitude. Save the surface and you save all. Save the appearance and you're a success. Pull off a few pounds and your universal destiny is assured. <laughs> Catering to this are probably 100 or 200 diets a year. And anyone who follows any one of those diets long enough will probably get into trouble. But people don't care because they want to keep the surface. They want the surface to look fine. So they sacrifice the inner life to the fulfillment of appearance. Now on the other side where we are dealing with mystical things, we are also facing a nutritional problem. We've got to feed the soul if we want it to amount to anything. If we want it to serve the purpose for which it was intended, if we want it to fulfill the unfoldment of our lives, we must give it proper nutrition. Now, the nutrition of the soul cannot be taken in through the mouth. It has to be brought into us in other ways. The soul is nourished on beauty, on affection, on friendship, on self-sacrifice, on sincerity, and in on integrity. The soul grows when the individual meets his responsibilities joyously, fully, and because, not because of fear of retribution, but because of love of truth. If we love truth more than we love ourselves, we have a very good chance of getting there. But as long as our lives are very largely dominated by self-interest, we are not going to get very far. So the nutrition of the soul is to build a better, complete personality. And this brings into our minds the whole field of learning. We have arts and sciences. We have specializations of a hundred different kinds. Some of these specializations are largely industrial or economic and therefore well provided for as far as students are concerned. But some of these uh, advancements, some of these advantages, are very largely the works for a higher type of consciousness, a higher type of mind, a person more deeply involved in constructive things. And every person who has uh, religious motives should try to build up a better understanding of world religion what it has stood for, what it has accomplished, and why, in some cases, it has failed. Uh, it is absolutely necessary to know what the world believes. 
And this is much more easily attained through direct contact with different faiths than it is through any metaphysical experience, because that experience is very likely to be erroneous unless the person already has a deep and abiding knowledge of the faith involved. This is one of the reasons why most Oriental development exercises are not very successful with Western people. It is because these exercises are part of a total life pattern. The exercises are geared to a way of life, to concepts, to ideals, to understandings, to responsibilities, to long established cultural trends and the acceptances of long honored uh, social responsibilities. Therefore, to try simply to breathe one's way into a high state of yoga or something is very unlikely where you do not know anything about the subject. You do not know how it is lived, what it means, why those who have followed it do follow a certain course. For example, in, in India, uh, a teacher that I know or knew, I, I believe they are now retired from society, as most of them do, if you were fortunate and you came to him when you were 10 or 12 years old and came from a good background, a family of devout people, that teacher would begin to gradually help you to strengthen your internal resources. And your probationship or your, uh, maybe a, your chalership would extend for about 10 years. For 10 years, you would do what you were told and nothing else. You would not only do it because you were told, but primarily because you respected the person who told you. His reputation as a teacher was known all over the country. He had many disciples, all of whom had done well. Therefore, you did what he ordered, never with a moment's hesitation. No matter how menial the task, it was done with perfect faith and peace of mind. After about ten years in which you proved that you could obey, it began to be time to think about the possibility of getting to the point where you could order something, where you could not only obey but teach. So after that first ten years of trailership, you might have a good discipleship for another ten years. And by the end of the twenty years, you would probably be involved in yoga. Now we expect to take it out of a book in two weeks. We expect to get it in ten easy lessons. And we wonder why, after having gotten it, we haven't gotten what we expected. But this isn't the worst. I've known a number in, of cases in which, having read these books, the individual had a series of psychological experiences in which he believed he had the yoga. He believed that he was practicing it, simply because he imagined that he was, and had some dreams and things to support it. Then all of a sudden the thing fell apart. And the, the dreamings and legends that he had accumulated turned on him. And he found that uh, he had not achieved anything except a very dangerous thought form. So the problem of understanding all these things is very hard for Western people. We are born in a hurry. And as a result of that, we live in a hurry. Our idea of a busy day is to spend so many hours at the office and the rest in front of a television set. The fact that the programs are atrocious is regrettable, but we're still there. Uh, I understand now that there is a move to get rid of the uh, non-commercial stations because they are elite groups. They like opera and good music and biographies and good drama. That makes them an elite group. And this, an, an elite group, is not appropriate in a democratic society. So we've got to move those over until they all are nothing but murders in order to have social equity. Well, all of this shows just exactly the pri problems that we have. We are simply very immature in matters of the spirit. We have built a great deal of physical construction. Economically, industrially, we are a very powerful people. But in our souls, in our inner lives, we are not maturing properly. We have the great need to give expression 
to that part of ourselves which is the best. And it is not until the best governs the rest that we can be an enduring civilization. The best of ourselves is our unselfishness. It is the recognition that we are here in a very simple relationship with life that we are here to grow together, to work together, and to discover the unity of life itself. We are here to create a great uh, uh, cosmotheism in space, a great democracy of cosmic systems. We are here to serve and love and fraternize with one another. Instead of that, we have gone into computers, now we are going into video games, and no one knows what will be next. But none of these things touch the inner life. And after a while, the inner life starts to scream. It wants something, but it doesn't know what it wants. It turns to evangelism and may or may not find what it wants. It searches in all directions and very often is caught in the web of mystery. Mystery becomes the escape from that which is completely physical. But the escape is dangerous unless the person involved is already stabilized in something. This rush from materialism to idealism with no growth, no practice, no discrimination in between is not safe. So we have to constantly try to build a releasing function within ourselves. Good reading, meeting with people who have interest and understanding serving public good in any way that we can, constantly enlarging our fields of knowledge. I always tell about my old friend Dr. Bronson, who was one of the grand old souls of my early life. And one day I saw him, he was nearly blind and had had paralysis agitans for years, but he was walking along with a book under his arm. I said, Doctor, what you reading? Oh, he says, this is the first year of Spanish. He was about 80. And I said, well, doctor, aren't you starting the language a little late? He says, it's never too late. The next time I'm here, I think they'll be doing a lot of Spanish going around. And I'm getting a start now. <laughs> no, it, uh, I talked to him more. Well, he said, how am I going to help people if I don't know their language? So if I'm going to help people, I've got to learn other languages because most of the people who are miserable need some kind of language guidance in their own worlds. So it's all in the motives. It's all in the enduring of principles and characters. We're not any of us going to finish a big project at this time. We're all going to go out half finished, but that is what brings us back. And actually, if we could get out of here all finished, it would be because we live in an awfully small universe. We've got to outgrow more than we've even grown into at the present time. But this is not only our duty, it is a wonderful realization of the infinite possibility of life. That there is no limit upon our lives except the limits we place ourselves. And these limits we gradually outgrow through repeated uh, embodiments. So in the uh, problem of growth, it isn't so much uh, the development of esoteric faculties as it is the earning of a better embodiment by meeting the needs that have been brought over from previous mistakes. We come here, we have a disposition that's difficult. Sometimes we're born with a prejudice that is almost unsurmountable. We come here with a quick temper or a slow temper. We are here disillusioned at birth and never get over it. Or we're here full of optimism and no substance, which actually also ends in difficulties. We bring into the world the faculties and developments that we have left unfinished. If we have lost, if we have no sense of humor, it's because we didn't finish it previously and we've got to learn now. If we are interested in the arts, of music, or literature, anything of this nature, we have a, an impulse because of past growth. But we must develop this impulse through, the gradually, through gradually maturing it and making it richer in values. And everything that happens has a spiritual overtone. Every book has a meaning, for good or bad, according to our understanding. 
We can learn something from mistakes. We can learn a great deal from errors. We can also come to broader understanding by reading something that isn't true. But it is necessary for us to gradually realize that it isn't true and realize why we might be tempted to accept it in the gratification of some personal attitude. The person in us is a wonderful being, but it's adolescent. We may be quite elderly in appearance, but maybe we're children inside. We are all children in the great plan of things because we are not anywhere near the end, which is our maturity. We have a long way to go. But it doesn't mean that it's a long way of suffering. It means that it's an opportunity day by day to overcome suffering, to, to bring into our own lives a freedom from the limitations which we have imposed upon ourselves. It is perfectly possible, therefore, to grow in various ways and if you find a little core of meditational life inside yourself, you then use this like a little candle. And in the old paintings I remember directly, there's a picture of an old saint that is attributed uh, to one of the masters of the Virgin, an artist whose name is not recorded. He is sitting reading the Bible. It's on an easel in front of him. And by his side is a single candle and he's reading the Bible by the light of this single candle. And it is presumed to be a portrait of St. Jerome. This one little light is being cast upon the scripture. And this candle signifies the eternal soul-spirit light within ourselves. Everything that we read, see, and do, we light from within ourselves. And the light that comes from within is meaning. It is the reason for the things that we see and the things that we hear. And it takes every action, every thought, every problem of the day and casts a light on it. And that light is insight, understanding. It is acceptance because within ourselves we have suddenly experienced a meaning in life, a meaning in the things that happen, a meaning in the books we read, and for that matter, a meaning in the dreams and visions that come to us a meaning which puts a light of spiritual certainty and integrity upon every action of our material lives. Every action of secular living that is not destructive is lighted. And that which is destructive is also revealed because of the integrity within ourselves. So the most important thing for most people to do is to get that light burning inside of themselves. Or keep it burning. Make it burn brighter but realize that its purpose is not just simply to burn in there. Its purpose is to cast a light upon the outside, to make daily living and daily thinking and daily working meaningful, so that the job is no longer drudgery, that the family is no longer a responsibility that destroys our own privilege to relax and have a good time, that the light within ourselves tells us that the real joys come from the fulfillment of the ideals and aspirations that we have. And these fulfillments are the beginning of a true spiritual insight. And as we gradually gain more and more light inside, which we gain from various outside sources sometimes also, we see a great painting that tells us something, we read an important article that reveals a truth we have always needed to know. It may come from the outside or the inside. But when this light shines from within ourselves afterwards into the world around us, it gives us the key to the conditions that we all must face. It gives us a reasonable understanding why every happening in life is a way of growth. Each incident is an advancement. Each day is an opportunity for the release of more of the true life and insight within ourselves. If we can begin, at least in part, to think in this way, we will discover also a great happiness. We shall discover that life is a joyful grow, a growing, and that the dirge we have put in there is simply misunderstanding on our own part. Life is not a series of tragedies. Life is a great series of opportunities to be more than we are. And to the degree of being more, we grow. And as we grow, 
all the uh, opportunities become steps towards spiritual liberation. With these types of th thoughts in our minds, uh, we will not re rely, or will not feel it necessary to rely too much upon a peculiar type of psychic experience. It is much better to hope that we shall earn and have a kind of mystical experience, an experience of alchemy, an experience in which all the base elements of knowledge are transmuted into soul power, all the marvelous opportunities for growth, all the beauty of nature, all of the labors and handicrafts of human beings are all part of a great language of expression, a language seeking to glorify God through the tools and instruments and bodies that we have in this world. Every part of our nature is created with the potential power to glorify reality. Every cell in the body, every nerve and fiber within us is part of a great plan to glorify life and most of all to pay homage to the giver of life. If we begin to move into this kind of thinking just a little bit, I think it will in many instances uh, lay the foundation for a growth that can be very important. And if, if in such growth, and by the achievement of such growth, if by quiet and gradual unfolding we reach a certain degree of harmonious adjustment with life, then the legitimate mystical experience will come. It cannot come until we are ready. And until we are ready, what might come instead is not the genuine thing. Only when we personally make the adjustments in our own lives can we expect the results. Now in many lives it may well be that we will do our best, but the mystical illumination will not come. It will not come because our large pattern of growth has not yet deserved it. But if we grow continuously and properly, life by life, we will not only have the mystical experience of understanding the full experience of existence, but we will also have the mystical opportunity and experience of knowing the one divine power that is at the source of everything. All of these experiences lead us back again to the glory of God and oneness with the great plan of life. And when we understand the plan, we will know the planner. But until we do, we must live as we are, seeing in a glass darkly. But someday, through proper growth and proper development, we shall see face to face. Well, thank you very much.